And we are back on the Zero Hour. I am Richard R.J. Escow, and joining us now is Phyllis Bennis. Phyllis directs the New Internationalism Project at the Institute, Institute for Policy Studies. She is a writer, an activist, and an analyst on Middle East and United Nations issues. Her new book is entitled Understanding ISIS and the New Global War on Terror, a Primer. Phyllis, thanks so much for joining us. Good to be with you, RJ. Hey, listen, uh, I guess my first question for you is, first of all, I'm, I was I was uh, very happy to see that this book came out because I think people have, uh, myself included probably, have a lot of trouble putting ISIS in the proper context here in the United States. But let me ask you, why did you feel that a primer on this topic was needed? Because I wanted to read one mm-hmm. first. I was looking all over the place for this kind of a book. I couldn't find one. And then my publisher said, look, you've written primers on other stuff. Why don't you write one on this? And I said, because I don't know enough. And he said, well, learn. So I studied for a few months and then I wrote the book. Well, that's great. And the reason why I say that is because, you know, we've talked before. I, I value your work and and your judgment. And I feel as if, in the one sense, we're inundated with... Uh, with uh, data bits about ISIS in this country, if you think about column inches in the newspaper or minutes on the broadcast media and so on, it's not that we don't hear the name, it's not that we don't see the images, but but we don't really have an interpretation of it uh, that that makes sense. And I feel, you know, I've I myself have tried to learn more and I, I've tried to read a, or I have read a couple of books from people that I would say are, you know, national security consultants. And my sense is that there's a culture that goes along with being a national security consultant that, you know, they have a lot of information, but maybe they don't put things in context the same way you or I might. You think that's fair or have you looked at their work? Well, I think that there's a, there is a culture and I think part of it is it's grounded in the assumption that military force is the option and we either use it or we do nothing. It's kind of the, the message that we heard from George W. Bush on the day after the 9-11 attacks where he said, we face this choice. We either go to war or we let them get away with it. It's war or nothing. It's never war or nothing. You know, I think that what we're seeing is a real failure to look at two major issues. One is, what was the origin of ISIS? Clue, it wasn't about Obama pulling the troops out of, uh, out of Iraq. And two, what are the options to dealing with ISIS beyond the military? So if we look at the first one, it's very easy to answer. What's the origin of ISIS? The origin of ISIS is in 2004, George Bush is president, and ISIS, or what was then called something else, but the same organization that eventually morphed into ISIS, was one of many Sunni-led, Sunni-dominated militias in Iraq fighting against U.S. occupation and against the government the U.S. had installed, a a sectarian Shia government. That's the origin of ISIS. So, uh, 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 Sorry, go ahead. So, so, uh, and just for listeners who don't know, obviously, you know, in the Middle East, you have uh, uh, certain sectarian divisions between uh, Sunni and Shia Muslims, although I think those have been inflamed by our invasion there, if my understanding is correct. But you have this division. You had the Sunni minority running, uh, essentially running the government, and correct me at any point if I'm wrong, running the government under <laughs> Saddam Hussein. We overthrew Saddam Hussein, a Shia government took over and uh, this the um, perhaps mistreated the Sunni minority and this in effect was the end result fair summary you think fair the only thing I would add is that even before the sectarian aspect of it took hold which was fairly early there was this anti-occupation part of it the origins of Isis are specifically grounded in opposition to the US occupation It started in 2004 when the occupation was only about a year old. And it was one of many. It was one of many organizations, both Sunni and Shia, that were fighting against the occupation. But it was in that context, exactly as you say, that sectarianism began to rise because even though Sunnis had been privileged during the years of Saddam Hussein's government, they had more higher positions, disproportionate power in the military in particular, it wasn't as if... The, the government, which was a ruthlessly secular government, it wasn't trying to impose some kind of Sunni uh, legislation or something. It was privileging a certain community, and it was through religion that that community was identified. 
What happened when the U.S. imposed Shia-dominated government took power was that the repression of Sunnis because they were Sunnis became incredibly strong. So after a period, including the period of the so-called Sunni awakening, when the U.S. decided it would be a good move to just pay off Sunni militias to fight on the U.S. side instead of against the U.S., that lasted for a couple of years until the U.S. decided, you know what, we're kind of done paying this. This is now going to be the responsibility of this government, this Shia-dominated government we've put in power. They're now going to pay these Sunni fighters to not fight against the government. And guess what? The Shia-dominated government decided, we don't really want to pay these guys. We're just going to stop paying them. So the opposition forces took hold again. And it was in that context that you saw a really powerful rise of the sectarianism that led to the sectarian civil war in Syria that was so strong in the period around 2007, 2008. Uh, and then it sort of faded away again. The, the ISIS group faded from sight. They didn't disappear, but they became much less overt in their, in their actions. And suddenly they kind of reappeared around 2011 uh, in Syria, having jumped over the border into Syria. And now they were operating in Syria. And they were far more sectarian and far more religiously defined than they ever had been before. So, And I think this is so important. We're talking with Phyllis Bennett, who is the author of Understanding ISIS and the New Global War on Terror, a primer, because I think there's a belief out there in parts of the national security community and the public at large and the political world that says, well, no, this is inevitable, that this kind of fanaticism is just endemic to the people of the region or to Muslims in general or to whatever, and, and, and that I think people have a hard time picturing a kind of cause and effect relationship between what we've done, including the invasion itself, the way the occupation was managed, uh, the firing of all the Bathists, uh, party members, whatever it is, putting a lot of people on the street from the army and the government and so on. I think it's hard for people to understand the idea that there might be uh, a causal, a chain of causality here. That, Absolutely. And, and so I, I think in that sense, again, uh, your book and your work in this area is very important. I, I would ask you, I guess, in researching this, Phyllis, um, were there any big surprises for you in digging into this, or did you pretty much kind of discover a pattern you had, you had yeah. uh, expected to see? You know, it's an interesting question. I came into this not knowing very much about the history of ISIS, and researching it I found that I wasn't terribly surprised. There, there's a kind of perverse logic to it, partly on the, from the vantage point of why did it emerge in the context of U.S. occupation, a U.S.-imposed government, et cetera. But it was also this question of how are they so powerful? That was one of the things that was hard to figure out. And I think for a lot of people, you look at this, what appeared to be a relatively small a uh, very extremist terrorist organization carrying out terrible acts of brutality, how is it that they're suddenly able to just move into, say, Iraq and, and take over huge swaths of territory, occupy the and control the entire city of Mosul, the, the second largest city in Iraq? It's a huge city. Mm -hmm. you know, we're talking about a situation now where uh, ISIS controls somewhere between five and six million people. It's governing a big piece of territory. And that was kind of hard to sort out. So I was trying to look at how is it that they managed to have such power? They don't have magical power because they're so believe so so strong, such strong believers in Islam or anything else. They have such power because they don't fight alone. Mm -hmm. And what I found in, in this research is that there were really sort of, particularly in Iraq, three arenas where they were getting massive support that made it possible for them to take over territory and, and govern cities and huge numbers of people. One was, where did they get their military strategy, their military training? You know, they're getting people who maybe they had some training as, quote, terrorists. You know, they, they knew how to rig bombs or something. But they didn't really know how to occupy territory and fight a conventional war, which is partly what they did. Well, they got that training and they got that strategy from a bunch of Iranian generals, mainly Sunni, who had been, as you said, who had lost their jobs, who had been kicked out, 
when the U.S. first invaded and occupied Iraq, the first thing it did was uh, to Phyllis, dismantle the military. Just to interrupt for a second, I think you said Iranian generals, and I think you meant Iraqi generals. I'm sorry, you're exactly right. Iraqi generals who had been powerful during the, the years of Saddam Hussein's rule, they had a lot of money to support their families, they had a lot of influence, they had a lot of credibility, and suddenly they're thrown out of their positions and they've got nothing, right? They've, they've got mm -hmm. no job, they have no way to support their family, nothing. So in that context, you have a scenario where they've been very angry and they're looking for somebody that they can ally with to fight back against this new sectarian government that has suppressed them and that is carrying out horrific attacks against the Sunni community. You know, mass arrests of young Sunni men, torture in prison, extrajudicial killings of large numbers of, of Sunni activists, the bombing of a, of a nonviolent Sunni protest camp. It's been really terrible. So they ally themselves with, uh, with, with ISIS, not because of the violence of ISIS and the extremism. These guys are mostly pretty secular, let's be clear. You know, they drink, mm -hmm. they smoke. But they were willing to ally themselves with these guys because they saw that as a way to go against the government. Then there were the Sunni militias, the tribal leaders who have militias at their control. And they joined with ISIS, again, not because they support the extremism, but despite that, because the sectarianism of the government was so terrible that it just seemed like the lesser evil. And then third, a large number, certainly not all or even a majority necessarily, but a large number of ordinary Sunnis threw in their lot with ISIS because they saw it as the only option for protecting their rights, protecting Sunni rights against the depredations of the government. So this whole question of how are they winning? How are they keeping territory in the face of these global and, and regional attacks has to do with who they fight with. So in effect, and we're talking with Phyllis Bennis, author of Understanding ISIS and the New Global War on Terror, a primer. Uh, so, in effect, we created a vacuum, uh, uh, as did the Iraqi government who we installed in power, uh, and they are filling it at this point. Uh, did you get a sense in your research of the status of, I, I've been curious about these people who are allies of convenience with ISIS, given the, the sort of severity of ISIS's, uh, unquestionable severity of their uh, practices and their interpretation of the religion and so on. <clears throat> do, you, uh, do, you, do you have a sense of the status of uh, the daily life or uh, uh, the way these generals are existing now? Because as you say, they're secular, they drink, they smoke, they have, they, they, they traded money and so uh, large amounts of money and so on. Um, are they getting by? Do they have privileged yeah, you status? Know, it's, it's a little less clear what's happened to the generals in terms of daily life. What's more clear but again it's it's small amounts of information that's that's leaking out from a very closed environment in the cities where ordinary iraqis and in many cases ordinary syrians are facing life under isis rules and there have been reports that for some people the as we know the the daily life has been absolutely horrific mm -hmm. women in particular have been treated as sex slaves sold given away as prizes of war, forcibly married off, some at a very young age, really young girls, uh, to ISIS fighters as prizes for acts of war or heroism as it's defined. So it's been horrific. There have also been reports from some people living in these cities, particularly in the city of Raqqa in Syria, which ISIS has identified as its capital, and for some in Mosul. Again, we don't know if these stories are accurate or if how many people would subscribe to this view, but there have been some stories that have come out that say they believe that for ordinary people, the stability provided under ISIS leadership is worth mm. the terrible repression in social, uh, social requirements. So what it might mean is for people living in Raqqa, as bad as things are there, it's worse in much of the rest of Syria, where the war is just raging on a much higher level. Which tells no. you, among other things, Phyllis Bennis, how terrible conditions must be in those other places. And I do want, I do want to. And, and if I could just add one other sure. point, it tells you how the U.S.-led wars is making it worse in the effort to supposedly defeat ISIS. Yes. Every time we hear these words. Well, there is no military solution. We can't do only the military stuff. We have to win hearts and minds. The problem is every time there's a military action, and almost all the actions we see are military, we don't see much on the 
diplomacy front, on the negotiations front, on the humanitarian front. We're not seeing nearly enough on any of those. All those things are almost impossible as long as the military attacks are still going on. So this is just one more example of how that works. Uh, uh, good. Uh, uh, thanks for pointing that out. And I do want to add, by the way, that the, you know virtually every Islamic authority in the, in the world, as Al-Azhar University and in Egypt and everywhere else, has, has rejected them Absolutely. as un-Islamic. It is important to make that point, but but it, this is, a, if, if nothing else, a form of extreme social control that's worked to their benefit, I suppose. Um, exactly. And we have to be clear that while their theology and their sort of understanding of the world, of the leadership of ISIS, seems to be grounded in 7th century social and religious laws and social and religious mores, they are running a 21st century movement and, a, and they are ruling 21st century territory, which means, for example, they have to recruit not only sociopathic uh, extremists who are in, intrigued by the violence, for instance, they need oil engineers. Right. They need doctors. Right. You know, there's a report of a of a woman gynecologist from the UK who was recruited to go to ISIS to open a pregnancy clinic in Raqqa to take care of the the so-called wives of the ISIS fighters. They want healthy babies, so they want doctors. They need yeah. engineers. They need people who can deal with the oil companies. That means they need money people that needs right. they, they need uh, uh, people who can deal with finance they need very modern trained people so they have to attract all those people to come with their families they can't rely solely on their attraction to people who want to essentially commit religious suicide well l last question for you phyllis Benison. it's a fascinating topic I, we could talk about it indefinitely but last question in the 30 seconds we have left uh um are Americans overly afraid of ISIS? Is that why we're unable to think in terms of a diplomatic solution, which seems to be what's called for here? Yes and no. I think people are too much afraid. ISIS's goal is to rule territory where they are. Their mm. goal isn't to come here and wreak havoc. It. It's not to say there couldn't ever be somebody trained by ISIS who comes to the United States, but that's not the danger. The danger is this kind of constant war and instability across such a huge swath of the Middle East. The reason that we can't think about other alternatives is because we're never presented with those alternatives. Right. We well, don't hear about it from President Obama. We don't hear about it from members of Congress. We don't hear about it in the mainstream media. We don't hear about it anywhere except in the alternative media, from individuals, from the peace movement, who are saying, yes, there are always alternatives. And Here's unfortunately, eight. we're going to have to leave it there. But uh, Phyllis Bennis, they, they can also hear about it from your new book, Understanding ISIS and the New Global War on Terror, a primer. And thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.